Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Katherine Hecht. I am the Executive Director of the Alexander Valley Film Society, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the sixth annual Alexander Valley Film Festival. Tonight, we are joined by some pretty stellar human beings who have come to share their experience, strength, and hope with us. And before we get started, and I get to introduce you to our killer moderator, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, why we're here and how we came to this moment. But first, I want to thank a couple of our sponsors. I want to thank Alain Martin Pierre and Johnny Drake, your compass in a complex real estate market. And I also want to thank our longtime friends, Ron and Jane Pavelka of Pavelka and Associates. Thank you, everyone who has contributed to the health of the society, the festival, whether you bought a ticket, a pass, or just sent us some good thoughts. We can all use them right now. And if we can't be together for the festival, it's amazing that we can get together online and to share amazing stories, meet amazing people, and try to make the world a better place. So on with the show. A little bit about why I have my name listed with my pronouns that you see at the bottom of your screen. One of the reasons I do this is to help normalize a culture where people who might be non-binary or gender non-conforming don't have to out themselves by telling you their pronouns. If we list them, if we all list them, it becomes something accepted and normalized. And Tonight, another reason that we have, or not another reason, but the reason we have ASL interpretation with us is because in our drive to create equity through access with, in, in, with specific regard to the film festival and the films we show, we realized that a lot of the films we have in the festival are not closed caption accessible. This has a lot to do with technical issues, and budgetary constraints for small budget filmmakers. And we'll address that in the future. It's a conversation that needs to be had. But tonight, the films that we asked our panelists to focus on, and that we prepared you by asking you to view them in preparation for this panel, these were available on the big Netflix, Amazon, those media content drivers, and those particular pieces of content are closed caption available. So we decided to create a vertical solution tonight. What we want to be able to offer is access in all forms. And so we've invited our partners from Communique to come with us and help tell the story of this panel through American Sign Language. So um, we're stumbling through and eager to have the tough conversations that we need to have to be the kind of organization we want to be. And that includes all of us as individuals and collectively as a group. So uh, I'm really excited to introduce our moderator tonight. I've only begun to get to know them, but I am so excited to find a kindred spirit who loves cinema as much as I do and loves getting into the weeds on some of the issues that make us most human. Please help me welcome Chelsea Rose. Chelsea Koenig, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, Chelsea. Hi, it's so nice to be here. Thank you so it's, much for having me. Oh, you're, you're welcome. It's such a pleasure to have you here and I've just thoroughly enjoyed our initial conversation. So thanks for taking the time to do this. And a big shout out to Positive Images. Thank you for sponsoring this panel and for helping us make it happen. This has been a dream of ours come true. So thank you on multiple fronts. Yeah, may I tell you about Positive Images for just a moment? I would hope you would. Cool. Um, I am the chair of the board of directors at Positive Images. It is an LGBTQIA center of Sonoma County located in downtown Santa Rosa. I am sitting in it right now in um, the corner that houses our library, which we actually hope to kind of reorganize because you can tell there's a chair kind of blocking part of the library. <laughs> um, right now our center isn't open as a physical space to the public because of COVID, um, the same reason that we are 
doing this uh, film festival online. Uh, all of our programming, however, has moved online. So we do have uh, weekly peer support groups for uh, youth and young adults, 12 to 24 years old. And we also have weekly programming um, support groups for adults. So it's our 30th anniversary year. It's a very weird year to be celebrating an anniversary, um, but we are excited to look uh, ahead toward the future. And um, right now our organization uh, supports 60% or so. The people who come through our center are transgender and about 60% of the trans folks that come to our center are non-binary. So this is uh, a panel that speaks to the community that is positive images, as well as folks who aren't yet connected to us. And Chelsea, before we introduce your panelists tonight, can you tell us what might be happening simultane simultaneously at Positive Images? Yeah, um, the beginning of Positive Images, uh, a therapist named Jim Foster back in 1990 recognized a need to support queer youth and started um, a group. It actually started on Thursday nights and it has continued to be um, one of the core pieces of our programming ever since. So there is a Zoom meeting happening simultaneously uh, that is our uh, youth-led youth programming um, that happens every Thursday from uh, 7 to 9 p.m. I don't remember what they're talking about tonight, but uh, <laughs> it is happening at the same time. That's awesome. Great. Well, welcome to our fancy studio. And would you, uh, I tell you what, so I am going to bow out of our stream. And um, as you welcome in your panelists, and then we'll just sit back and have a hopefully a relaxing but stimulating conversation. And I'll see you again at the end. Sound good? That sounds fantastic. Thank you. Okay, I'll see you later. So uh, we are going to bring in three panelists. I'm super, super thrilled to introduce you to all of them. And tonight's conversation takes three different films as a jumping off point to talk about trans representation in media. Um, those films are all available on streaming sites right now. Um, so you don't actually need to be specifically connected to the festival to be able to find them. Uh, we are looking at Disclosure, which is a documentary that just came out this summer, and that is available on Netflix. So, uh, Dr. Susan Stryker, one of our panelists, is in the film. And then we're looking at two films that center on Marsha P. Johnson. There's the feature-length documentary, The Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson, which came out in 2017 and is also on Netflix. And finally, there's a 15-minute short film that you can find on Amazon called Happy Birthday, Marsha, that is kind of a blended documentary and, um, and acted film uh, directed by Tourmaline about Marsha P. Johnson's life as well. Our panelists tonight are Dr. Susan Stryker, uh, who is Professor Emerita of, hi, nice to see you. Um, nice to be here. Dr. Stryker is professor, professor Emerita of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Arizona and currently holds the Barbara Lee Professorship in Women's Leadership at Mills College um, this year through 2022. Stryker is the founding executive editor of TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly, author of Transgender History, The Roots of Today's Revolution, and co-director of the Emmy award-winning documentary film, Screaming Queens, The Riot at Compton's Cafeteria. Then we have Arya Saeed. Arya is a transgender act advocate and award-winning political strategist based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Hi, Arya. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, it's such a pleasure to have you. Uh, Arya is the founder and executive director of the Compton's Transgender Cultural District, the world's first transgender district, celebrating the resilience, culture, and presence of transgender people in San Francisco's famed Tenderloin neighborhood. Um, relevant to this conversation, uh, Dr. Stryker's work on Screaming Queens and work when she was at the GLBT Historical Society 
um, in part was unearthing that history that later led to the creation of the cultural district that Aria co-founded. Um, Aria is also the founder of Queen Culture Initiative, a social and cultural empowerment project for Black transgender women. Ms. Saeed and her efforts have been featured in numerous media platforms, including Forbes, CNN, The Daily Mail, Out Magazine, Marie Claire, The Guardian, Huffington Post, CBS, Vice, and the San Francisco Chronicle. And our third panelist is Cash Martinez. Cash is an Indihe queer journalist and LGBTQ media activist based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Their areas of interest as a journalist include LGBTQ and BIPOC communities, marginalized youth, and public education. Hi, Cash. Hi, Chelsea. This is so high tech. I love that I just say a name and then you pop up on my screen. It's really fun. Um, his work has appeared in the Press Democrat, Sonoma Magazine, and in the North Bay Bohemian. Martinez is currently a sophomore at San Francisco State University, where they serve on the journalism department's student advisory board. He is also the founder of San Francisco State's student chapter of NLGJA the Association of LGBTQ Journalists. Thank you very much, all of you for being here with us. Um, so we have a lot, we have a little time and a lot that we could talk about. Um, we're looking at documentary films, we're looking at films that talk about um, the lives of specific activists, um, Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, and activists surrounding their lives, um, as well as uh, in disclosure, we're looking at so many different media portrayals, fictional and nonfiction, um, of transgender people, and looking at that historically and in this present moment where it's kind of exploded into um, so much of a more visible cultural touchstone. Um, and through all of this, I think the biggest question that comes up as a through line um, is looking at what difference it makes who is telling a trans story. So I would love to open that up. Um, we can start with Susan, if you'd like to kind of talk a little bit about um, how that question lands for you regarding all of these different pieces of media. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for, um, for that invitation. Now, when I listen to myself talk, I'm hearing some echo and feedback. Are you hearing me okay? I hear you fine. I think there was some echo at the start, but it went away. Everything's okay now. Great. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, one of the reasons I I was I, I think it's important to ask, you know, who, who is telling a trans story for whom, um, is that uh, you know if, if you look at the film disclosure, and I hope some of your audience has, has seen that, a lot of the films the, the film clips represented in that film are I would say films made by non-transgender or cisgender people uh, for non-transgender or cisgender people. And it's just a complete, you know, fantasy, you know, what trans lives are actually like. And, you know, they, they a, a lot of mainstream media uh, represent trans people in the most stereotypical and inaccurate ways. And so I think having, um, uh, a, a trans presence in the project somehow, either as a director or actors or writers is really important for um, to, you know, bringing an element of, of uh, verisimilitude uh, or accuracy to, um, uh, to a, a film project that re represents trans people on screen. Um, but the other thing that I was thinking about, you know, specifically since your, your audience was asked to watch um, The Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson and Tourmaline's film, 
um, uh, happy birthday, Marsha, is I don't know if there's any awareness of this or you were thinking about it when you were programming it, but there was quite the controversy when those films came out that um, uh, David France um, uh, was accused by Tourmaline. David France, the director of um, Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson was accused by Tourmaline of um, uh, co-opting the story that she was telling about Marsha Johnson in her own film or of not um, adequately giving credit to where he had sourced some of the materials. And it becomes, you know, it becomes a really complicated question because, I mean, to, to, to my mind, because um, it's not like Tourmaline owned some of the archival material that David France included in the film. And on the other hand, she also did a lot of labor to like, find where that material was and make it available for the, the public. And so then the, the question comes up, well, who is it who did the labor to make the film possible or to make telling the story of, of Marsha's life possible in a visual medium? And then who is it who gets the most credit for that? So, you know, I, I think all the accusations of theft might be a little overblown. The issue that Tourmaline raises is absolutely critical uh, to thinking about sort of the, the ethics and the deeper politics of who is it who gets to tell a trans story? You know, is it, um, should a, the story of a black trans woman's life be, be told by a black trans woman uh, who has a different relationship to the story or should it be told by a white, cis gay man who comes in and just thinks it might be an interesting story. So I, rather than answering that question and saying like, this is right and that's wrong, I think the controversy around those two films, um, it, they, 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 it could open up into a really fruitful conversation about the ethics of documentary filmmaking. And maybe yeah. one of the other panelists would like to jump in on that. Yeah, it, it was a conscious decision to, um, when I heard about the plan to screen Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson, I requested that we ask people to also watch Happy Birthday, Marsha, so that we could have this conversation. And I am really struck by, um, in one of Tourmaline's articles, she talked about like living paycheck to paycheck while someone else who is cisgender and white gets, you know, the budget to produce a Netflix, a Netflix documentary that's feature length. So I would love to turn that over to one of our other panelists to talk more about. Um, I guess I can jump in. I think what makes um, that situation in particular um, even more spicy is that um, Tormalyn did allege that um, she had applied for an artist grant for her film and that he was actually one of the review panelists, the, um, the other director, and sort of got to see all of the content and then was inspired to make um, a similar, I guess, film too, which is, is quite complicated. Um, I think the reality is, is that um, the cisgender gaze, I think the, the ways in which um, cisgender people want to see trans people, um, and 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 now we've seen that representation over so many years, um, is is really rooted in, in sensationalism, um, and and a desire and fantasy, like Dr. Shecker was saying, of of how to see our experience, our bodies, and I think um, there are, of course, filmmakers who. Um, with seeing more trans people being represented are um, representing us in their content with humanity and dignity, um, even if they don't have proximity to trans people. Um, so I think there, as long as um, our lives and our, our journeys are, are sh and our narratives are shared um, with respect and humanity and, and dignity, um, I think people can tell our stories, but I think trans people, um, because we are a small population and, and marginalized in the ways that we are, 
and not vastly represented, um, that we we should be there should be a proactiveness and in, and in involving us in telling our story. Yeah, just kind of going off of what Aria said, but also what Susan said about how non-trans filmmakers and non-trans media creators aren't making these stories for transgender audiences. They're making them for cisgender audiences. I think that it really comes down to sort of pandering to these cisgender audiences, what they assume or what they stereotype about transgender people. And I mean, you see that throughout horror, for example, the genre of horror films, transgender people are, people are always the villain in these films. Psycho, Sleepaway Camp, just to name a few. Um, but yeah, I agree with Aria, what she said about how having non-trans filmmakers or media creators tell our stories is really sensationalizing them. And I would say in some cases, just straight up generalizing what we all go through. I mean, the trans community is not a monolith. Like as a trans masculine person, I'll never know what it's like to be a trans feminine person, but a lot of cisgender filmmakers will group us together and assume that we all have the same experiences or same feelings about our experiences. Um, so yeah, I think it's important for transgender people to be put on um, sort of made center stage in regards to telling trans stories, because I think there's no way to have good representation without that key aspect. Yeah, and just to, to, to jump in with a, a another anecdote about some of the sort of, I feel like complexities and pitfalls of, um, not representing a trans life with sort of respect and dignity and with um, without really taking a trans perspective into view. Um, many of your audience members may have seen The Danish Girl uh, a few years ago. And, you know, I, because I've been doing trans history and trans studies and I'm a filmmaker, I, I get to see a lot of behind the scenes stuff with, with films. And I was one of the consultants on that project. You know, I mean, not, not very centrally directed at all, but it's like I talked with, you know, the, the producers and the director. And, you know, I said really early on that it's like, you know, I think this is gonna be good at, at one level, but you're kind of making making it into a cross-dresser story. You know, like you're kind of making the story of um, Lily Elba be about a heterosexual couple where um, the man wants to be a woman and the wife goes along with it, you know, because she loves her husband to the point that she will sacrifice the man she loves so that he can become the woman of his dreams. And that it's sort of told as like a, a heterosexual tragedy, you know, um, and that I, you know, I, I was telling them, I, I said, you know, I, that, that wasn't what those people's real lives were like. It's like Lily Elba and Gerda Wegener, the two historical people that the story were based on. It's like they had a trans lesbian relationship. Like they were poly and kinky and bohemian and like they were living it up in Paris. They were not uh, kind of like a, a really straight couple where one of them was like, trans and it was tragic. And I said, that's the wrong framework for telling that story. And the word came back that, you know, the, the powers that be at the studios said, yeah, we just don't see that as a story that we can find the emotional heart of, you know, it's just like, I don't think that story is going to land with people. So basically it's like they were, it was, cis people making a movie for cis people about a trans person and telling it in a way that cis people could relate to. And it really had very little to do with like actual historical trans people's lives, so. That's kind of raising a question that Cash and I got into. I'm hoping that I can kind of word this succinctly. I guess we are seeing more instances of trans people telling trans narratives. Um, 
And I wonder whether you feel like some of those are totally mainstream. And when we see anything being made for the mainstream, we can assume that a lot of people who are cisgender are going to be seeing that media. So I guess I want to ask, like, do you feel that, um, do you feel that cis creators have underestimated cis viewers, like, capacity to empathize with trans narratives? Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, wait, was that me? Sorry, I didn't hear the echo again. Um, I would say that I think, yes, to answer your question, yes, there has always been, um, we have always been underestimated. I think now, um, turn down the volume on my computer, got it, all right. Um, I think now you all get to, not you all, but <laughs> cis and non-trans people get to witness um, us having agency um, to discuss um, our journeys um, and, and, and share our complexity of our lives um, in, in terms of media um, and even in, in activism. I think before it was, um, right, the, the representations that we had were, um, you know, caricatures and, um, and making fun of us. And, um, but we were always silent, right? We didn't have the power to be able to respond. Um, and, uh, and counter what was uh, being portrayed for trans people. And I think um, with shows like Pose on FX, um, you get to really see, I mean, of course I have tons of critique for, for any show really, but I think what you do get to see is you get to see real development of people's lives and journey. Um, you get to see character development, you get to see nuance. Um, and I know so many cis people or, or non-trans people who um, love and adore the show and, and also um, are now having more experiences of finding connection to those characters. Um, and with the characters having, um, really mirroring a lot of what trans people are still going through, um, even though it's like a period series, so it takes place in the 80s and early 90s. Um, and I think, what to their credit is they um, included um, and promoted trans people in every arena that they could from production to writing, obviously the cast, um, and even just behind the scenes of, of trans folks, um, you know, clocking in and out and being a gaffer or a lighting person or makeup, hair, um, in, in, in harmony with um, non-trans um, staffers and, and production as well. Cash, did you want to comment at all? Um, yeah, well, I was, it, Aria, it's so interesting that you brought up Pose because I was just talking to Chelsea about this earlier today, but um, we were talking about how when cis men uh, play trans women in movies like The Danish Girl or Dallas Buyers Club, they're nominated and they win Oscars. But for Pose, I mean, it's been snubbed at the Emmys two years in a row. And even this year, the only nomination was for Billy Porter, who is a uh, cis gay man, but he's still a cisgender person. And he's one of the few cisgender characters that I can think of on the show. Um, so yeah, I don't know if it's just because <laughs> the film industry has a weird vendetta against transgender people, or if it's because they think that's the aspect of those if they think that the cisgender aspect of the shows is what people watch for um no, oh sorry oh no it's okay i was just that was it <laughs> i was just gonna say i think the um i think the experiencing that we're witnessing right with the only cis male um actor on on the cast of that portion of the cast right on the headlining cast um being consistently validated and awarded for their contribution to the effort is also proof that people, cis 
and non-trans people um, would like to believe that if we are trans and we are playing um, a character who is also trans on film, then we're not really acting. Um, is the way that I have consistently interpreted it. Um, and even in talking with the cast, I think um, they can't say publicly, but many of their experiences have been rooted in being told that they're not real actors. Um, whereas um, the cis people on the show are considered real actors. Um, and I think that plays a huge part in terms of um, equity in, in entertainment industry right now. Like we've, we've been asking for us to be represented, um, right? For so many years, for decades. Um, and now that we are, there's a whole new frontier of um, advocacy that has to happen in that particular industry. Uh, being seen as artists and, and as at the same level of, of other actors and, and, and producers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I hope you don't think this is too much of a, a, a stretch or too deep a dive into sort of like the, the film theory. I'll be, be quick with it. But in the film Disclosure, they one of the things they used me for in that film was to talk about um, the very, very early um, presence of trans people in, or trans representation in cinema. I mean, going back to D.W. Griffith and the mm -hmm. invention of some of the very earliest techniques like cutting film to tell um, visual stories in the cinematic medium. Uh, and that um, the, they, they paired my comments on, uh, on showing drag in early cinema with Yance Ford talking about um, D.W. Griffith's racism and with the prevalence of blackface in early cinema. And when I, I had a chance to do a, 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 a panel with uh, the director, Sam Fader, a couple of weeks ago, and this question came up about like, why is there so much both like cross-dressing and blackface in early cinema? And my answer for that is to say that at some level, what you're seeing in cinema is this very powerful technology. You know, you see it from the beginnings of that the medium is, is invented. Um, the, the, this way that like it uses whiteness and white masculinity is what I would call like the master signifier. It's like the cultural belief is that whiteness and masculinity are like the generic forms of a person. You know, it's like a, a human is like by default white. A human is by default, you know, male centered. And that where you get gender and color, it's just like, it's like putting drag on a white body. It's just like you get color and femininity by adding a layer to the generic white male body. Right. And so like, that's why we see all of this, like really, you know, messed up representation of transness in film is that it's essentially, it's like, why is it that Jared Leto or, or Dustin Hoffman or Eddie Redmayne gets nominated? Because it's what people at some level, the cultural fantasy believes in anyway. A woman is in some ways just like a generic human disguised in feminine drag. Mm. Um, I totally appreciate you taking kind of that deeper dive. I actually said to Cash on the phone that I thought it was like really bold um, in disclosure that it does kind of open with uh, you talking about like the cinematic cut and kind of the heaviest like cinematic theory stuff in that film is foregrounded at the very front. Um, at, like at the very beginning of the film, that was kind of surprising to me about it. And I think a really cool place to start um, for that conversation. Yeah, I was glad they did it, you know, it's like, and it was Laverne Cox, you know, it's like she was, um, you know, she was at my interview there and, and, you know, it's like, she loved that. It's like, we, we did this like whole lecture on, um, on uh, film history and they, you know, they had to kind of keep cutting it down, cutting it down, cutting it down to make it, you know, work in the film. But, um, but yeah, I kind of give Laverne credit. She was the executive producer on the film. It's like she really wanted that that content in there. 
Um, can we talk as I as I was watching Disclosure, the the, the like one of the just overarching words for me to describe so much of the media that cis people have created about trans people um, is just irresponsible. Like it is so, there's a moment, I forget who says it, but there's a moment where someone says like, I wonder if anyone, it might be Laverne Cox um, saying like, I wonder if anyone making these films thought about how these would land for a trans person, like whether a trans person would see these depictions, um, whether they're the comedic like depictions where trans people are the butt of a joke and specifically their transness is the butt of the joke or whether it's um, the revelation that someone is trans being repulsive. Um, and so as a counterpoint to that, I would love to talk about like, I think the irresponsible portrayal like adds to the responsibility that um, people find placed on them, that trans creators and cis creators who want to do good portrayals of trans people um, that are not reckless, there's like a heavy responsibility there. Um, I think that that content ends up carrying and I would love to hear about that. I mean, I wanted to to kind of pepper in Chelsea. Um, I know you were saying irresponsible, but I also feel like those things were absolutely intentional too, though, um, right? Because Susan was talking about like the fantasy of, um, yeah, I wonder, I, I don't think they actually cared if any trans people were watching or witnessing. Um, I'm in the city also, there's tons of sirens, I'm so sorry. Um, but I think, yeah, the, gauging that impact wasn't of interest to them because they thought that they were being edgy or being an artist or being funny. Um, and, and, and that was enough for the creators in those moments, um, in my opinion. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that. I irresponsibility is is one one point and something that comes up and is really galling. Um, but the fact that it is like uh, it is completely intentional and so um, dehumanizing that it seems very clear in a lot of these portrayals that. Um, that the creators don't care because they don't actually even recognize or care about the humanity of the characters they're depicting. I mean, I also have a really dark sense of humor. So there was a clip in Disclosure of, I think from Sex and the City, which is one of my favorite shows. I've watched this episode of probably a million times, but. Samantha was like, I'm living in a neighborhood that's trendy by day and tranny by night. And I used to laugh at that every single time. So it was funny to me, but in watching it and disclosure and really thinking critically, um, I had this experience of like, yeah, we had no real depth or agency in that portrayal in that whole episode. Um, like, even though there was like, comedy and there were black trans women in the alley as sex workers, even when Carrie Bradshaw is like dialoguing about uh, pre-op transsexuals and, um, you know, secretly bisexual men, like everything was just like a jab at um, the trans characters that they were portraying in that episode. Um, and, and really thinking about, was it really funny when that actually is an actual reality? Um, for so many people. When I say reality, I mean, they were portraying black trans women who were survival sex workers and made them the punchline joke of the the entire episode. Um, so yeah. That, that like goes so nicely into, I think talking about, um, talking about 
context. Um, there are these kind of uh, so many portrayals of trans people as trans women, specifically trans women of color as sex workers. Um, as though there's no, um, with no context around like why a lot of trans women, particularly trans women of color, um, might be doing survival sex work, um, let alone anything else about their lives. Um, and then with like the documentary about Marsha P. Johnson and as Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera's lives um, have kind of been documented and, and as that document has been lifted as much as it has, um, we do, we have like um, some of the best known um, like celebrated trans women in history um, are people who did survival sex work and hopefully now we understand like other things about their lives beyond sex work and, and sex work not as um, funny in and of itself, um, but personality and, and socioeconomic factors that uh, lead to people being in sex work for survival. Um, so I, I would love to hear from um, Susan or Aria on, um, I guess trans women sex workers who were revolutionaries. Yeah. Well, just briefly, because I feel like I've spoken a, a lot recently, and I'd be interested in hearing some from from Cash, who I think has been a little on the short end of the the, the stick here. One of the things that I um, um, focused on in the film that I made with my colleague Victor Silverman uh, about like why was it that trans women rioted against police oppression in San Francisco in the summer of 1966? And it's because, you know, like they had been contained in the Tenderloin as a, as a ghetto. It's like not allowed to live in other parts of the city. It's like we interviewed people who like back in the day, like, you know, just trans woman comes to San Francisco, the police find her in the Haight-Ashbury, put her in the police car, take her to the Tenderloin and say, this is the neighborhood that you're supposed to be in. Uh, there were people couldn't find apartments to rent in other parts of the city. They couldn't find jobs. And so it's like you get physically concentrated in the sex works that ghetto and told the only thing that you can do is be a prostitute. And so you be a prostitute because like you like to eat, you know, and you need a place to sleep at night. You know, so that there's a way that that society has historically been organized to compel trans women to be in sex work. You know, so that's the context. And it, you know, it is a really important, historically important part of trans feminine experience and history. And, um, you know, I think it those stories should be told and even for people who do sex work, it's like, it's not their whole life story. You know, it's just like, it's not, it's not the only thing that they are. It's like, it's their job, it's what they do. And so, you know, why can't we tell, um, you know, why can't we tell about some, a story about some woman who happens to be a sex worker, but that's actually not the focus of the story. You know, why, why not do that? Yeah, I agree. I agree with you, Susan, on that. Um, I think that, people like to think that tr black trans women working as sex workers, it just comes out of nowhere or it's just what they're like predisposed to do. But I was talking with Chelsea about this earlier and I brought up that queer youth are at a higher ri risk for attempting suicide. It doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from discrimination, just as black trans women are discriminated against in terms of housing employment, where they can live, um, by police especially, and that's what pushes them into doing survival sex work because like we all have bills to pay. Um, so, and I'm kind of curious as to whether or not you, either any of you think that um, the depictions of black trans women as sex workers in films perpetuates black trans women 
continuing to do survival sex work or if that's just something that has been ingrained and exists outside of media representations? Um, well, I feel like years ago, I always heard this statement that like media informs the public, right? And then the public or the people inform media. And I think what you're saying, Cash, is um, I think absolutely right. The reality is, is um, at least my own experience as a black trans woman and coming to a big city as a teenager, um, having had previous work experience um, and coming to, you know, specifically San Francisco, a city that I was told would fully embrace me. Um, I still struggled in trying to gain traction and being um, a good citizen of society. Um, I went to, I applied to every job I could, right? From um, McDonald's to Old Navy to Sephora, like anything that was within reach. Um, and, you know, people would mock me, make fun of me. Um, I remember I went into um, a room to interview and um, everyone in the room started laughing, right? And then people would be like, what? No, this is San Francisco. It's okay to be you. And I'm like, girl, no. And eventually my stomach growled and I was, you know, I was up to a lot of things at that time. But anyways, um, you try to find any way to, to, to avoid it, at least I did, because I didn't want to be that stigma, right? The, the black trans people I grew up seeing were on Jerry Springer. Um, and my mom, when I was a teenager, I transitioned in high school. And so at that time, I think Isis King, shortly after, like came out on America's Next Top Model, and this was like a big deal. Um, and so for me, my mom was like, you're gonna be like one of those freaks on Jerry Springer. And like, so that was always in my head um, when I was here. And um, yeah, I got into sex work because it was the only option that I had. Um, and then I was like, okay, well, this is my reality. And so I, I chose to stay in it for a very long time. Um, it actually wasn't until like, a violent situation had occurred that I was like, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna lead a normal, quiet life, <laughs> and sort of made a switch um, into nonprofits. But, um, but I think the reality still holds true. Um, most Black trans people will find it very difficult to get um, any job outside of um, sex work or um, like doing female impersonation shows is what they call them, like drag shows, um, or like entry level roles at like an LGBT nonprofit. Um, that's typically the, the, the opportunities that we have in front of us. I think the world is shifting, but I think for those listening in, um, you know, as much as we see trans people represented on television, also ask yourself when you go to your local coffee shop, or your dry cleaner, or your library, or school. Like, do you see or feel that those spaces have trans people in them, specifically Black trans people? Um, and it, and it's purely systemic. It's not that we're not applying to those jobs. It's just somehow we don't end up getting them. And so, even with greater visibility and and access to our lives, um, there's still a way in which day to day, there's so much stigma towards um, having trans people in a workplace or in a room or, or what have you. Those things have not like evaporated because we're on television. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, just to jump in a little bit there, um, you know, I, I feel like in, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, I've had a very privileged life, you know, like I, I mean, I, I come from a white, rural, southern, working class background, you know, it's like I went to public schools and universities on scholarship, you know, I did get, you know, a PhD from, from Berkeley because I was a good student and I, you know, 
worked hard and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I didn't have a lot of, you know, barriers, you know, in my way. It's like somebody who at that time was like walking in the world as a, you know, white man. Um, and that, you know, it's like, as soon as I transitioned, you know, it's just like, I just like felt those doors just slam in front of my face. And, um, you know, I, um, um, you know, I had a stint doing sex work, you know, I wasn't doing street sex work. I worked as a pro dom for a while. And it was really important for me to do that because I thought, you know, it's like, if this is what I need to do to make a living, I just sort of need to make sure I can do this. And it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I can do this work. If I can do other work, you know, it's just like, you know, maybe I'm more, got more aptitude for doing another kind of work, but it's like, you know, I, I can do this. Um, and, you know, and I, you know, there's, there's, there's no shame in it, you know, um, and that the, the, um, one of the things I have often said is that for most trans women, the world lets you have one job, and that is to figure out how to get the world to pay you for being a trans woman. Come to it. Yeah, there we <laughs> go. And and it's just like you can do that for like you know like a you know twenty dollar you know hand job in the back of a, you know backseat of a car, or you can do it by like going out on the lecture circuit and like lecturing on transgender history, you know, because it's like, I'm trained as a historian. I know that, but it's like, it's still the same gig. It's like, it's like still me, me figuring out a way to get paid to do trans something as a trans woman. It's like, and that's what my life gets narrowed down to. And I have, you know, I have to like, okay, like that is the narrow gate that, you know, life is having me run through. And I'm gonna run with it as hard and long as I can. And it's like, and I've done all right, you know? It's like, I've done all right. Uh, but I still feel, you know, the constriction that is put on trans women's lives, you know? So in spite of the privilege that I've had, I have also felt the trans oppression. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, Susan, you are speaking to me right now. I'm like, this is literally, yeah, this is literally what I tell my team all the time. Um, I don't, I don't have a college degree, so for me, sex work. Um, I was actually very empowered um, in doing sex work, and I think a lot of Black trans women don't get a lot of opportunity to actually talk about that. But um, it's where I learned to have an actual like self esteem. It's where I learned um, how to fundraise, all the skills that I have in leading an organization. I learned from being a hooker. Um, and so, of course, um, yeah. Um, okay. Great. Um, I, I love hearing you say all of this. And I, um, I know, Aria, that you worked with um, St. James Infirmary, um, like passing out condoms and and clean needle exchange um, to street-based sex workers, and that now you're doing um, work at the Transgender Cultural District um, that advocates uh, broadly for trans people living in the Tenderloin and also for like sex worker legislation. Um, that is still so much a part of the work that you do, even though now you're in an office um, supporting that work and the lives of um, Black and Indigenous trans women, uh, in on like in different ways, um, both super on the ground and and from the office. Uh, so I would love for you to talk a little bit more. Um, we got a question from Lori in Cloverdale, wanting to hear you talk a little bit more about the work of the transgender district. Um, yeah, so the transgender district is um, geographically. Um, six blocks in the southeastern Tenderloin, um, and it is a legally recognized cultural district um, by our city. Um, I think loose examples of cultural districts for other people's reference point is um, usually every city has a Chinatown or like a Koreatown, a little Italy, an old Ukraine, um, neighborhoods that foster um, the local economy um, of a group that have had a continuous presence um, in those neighborhoods. And um, I think 
with the transgender district, um, specifically because of um, Dr. Stryker's work, um, we were able to showcase to um, our city and, and, and to other people um, the ongoing presence of trans people um, in this neighborhood um, for so many decades, as well as um, historic events that have taken place. Um, and then, you know, acknowledging the, the reality that um, this neighborhood holds the densest population of transgender people of any other neighborhood in the city. Um, and yet so many and so much of our community um, live in extreme abject poverty. Um, and so our work uh, was founded in 2017 and, and it's really in short, um, a radical solution and mandate to address the disparity that we face, um, but also to give trans people both here in San Francisco and around the world, a sense of, of belonging and place. I think as trans people so often we're trying to find where we fit. Um, and so we took that to be a tangible experience of like, here we are, this is this is our neighborhood. Um, and and we can own businesses and we can actually have housing and um and we can employ other trans people and, and create our own economy. If the world won't hire us, um, right? And and in, in these jobs and we'll create the jobs for ourselves um, and create our own thriving economy um, and, and, and space that we're empowered, a space that we see ourselves reflected, um, that we see our shared experience literally cemented in the ground. Um, and so, of course, the work is so much more than that, but um, for the sake of time, um, if you Google transgender district, um, it's, everything should come up. Thank you so much. I knew I knew 45 minutes would go by so fast. I knew an hour would go by fast too. And we are almost at the end of the hour. Um, I did have a question from Rory in San Francisco. Um, it just says, does Cash see any generational difference? So I'm not exactly sure sort of how that question ends, but I would love to hear Cash. Um, you are 19 and... Yes. Um, younger than everyone else on the panel. So I would love to hear you either speak to what it felt like to look back at these um, sort of recent past generational experiences of trans representation in the media that we watched, um, or you can look ahead and talk about like what you, um, what opportunities you see for yourself and are making for yourself looking toward the future. Yeah. Um Generational differences. I mean, I don't want to make anyone feel old, but um, okay, yeah, I, I already do. <laughs> All right, the moment that Chelsea said it, I already started. <laughs> um, I would say that I feel like the transgender community and the LGBTQ community in general is a lot more connected than they were 20 years ago, and I think that's mostly because of social media. It's really easy to find these little groups of people who are like you and be able to relate to them. Um, so that's like one major thing that I would say. I would also say that the climate on college campuses is probably a lot more accepting than it was for when maybe Susan was going through college. Um, I mean, we still have a lot of work to do, but there's queer trans resource centers, um, queer straight alliances, different student chapters for LGBTQ, insert job title here, um, that there weren't those things uh, over 20 years ago, which is weird to think about because, I mean, it's like over my lifetime, but I guess in the long, in the big picture, that's not that long ago that that happened. Um, mental health. I think not just for the queer community, but for everyone in general, mental health is a lot less stigmatized. It's a lot easier for people to feel like they're able to speak up about mental health issues or talk about going to therapy. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I could go on for a while, but I know we've already passed the hour mark. Um, 
so. I do want to respect our audience's time, even though I bet you our audience wants to wants to keep talking. I know I do. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists and to our interpreters for being here. Thank you to Alexander Valley Film Society for focusing on um, justice in this entire um, 2020 film festival and letting us look at these depictions of uh, trans representation and talk with these three phenomenal um, activists in the trans community. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all. having me. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, we probably could go on and keep talking for another hour or five. Um, but yes, thank you everybody for tuning in and uh, we will see you hopefully at other stops during the festival. And until then, stay safe, stay sane and stay connected. Bye everybody. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.